Hello, uh, this is Minder Chen, and this is the second half of our communication module. Um, I'm a professor of Management Information System at Martin Bismick School of Business Economics at CSU Channel Island. So let's just get right to it. Uh, if you want to be a good communicator, uh, the best way to do it is to learn from the master communicator. And Steve Jobs is considered one of the best um, communicator. Um, and a lot of Apple's um, product launched uh, under his um, watch as a CEO. Um, he personally gave those product launch of uh, iMac, iPod, uh, iPad, and uh, iPhone, etc. Uh, it, it's worth um, try to dig out some of his product launch video to see how he uh, convinced people that Apple has the best product. And however, um, in order to deliver a, a great presentation, it takes a lot of uh, preparation. So the the secret of uh, giving a good presentation is uh, preparation, preparation, and preparation. Uh, prepare your content, uh, knowing your audience, and, and put your content together in the right logical sequence and spice it up with the proper audio, visual, image, etc. And, and deliver it uh, properly. Okay. And another um, resources is the TED, uh, TED Talk uh, at this website that uh, you find a lot of great speaker on a variety of subject. Uh, they give a talk on the area they're uh, really good at uh, for about 15 minutes and, and watch how they uh, give their presentation. And there's a book um, which discussed the presentation secret of Steve Jobs. Uh, it's uh, show up here. And this is just a, um, a blog entry to which um, highlights some of the presentation skill by Steve Jobs. So uh, let's see um, an example. Uh, here's the link for the iPod uh, product launch in 2001. And in, and then first of all, Steve Jobs used really a slide with very few words. Um, and here you see um, a slide that uh, tried to um, explain the uh, storage um, uh, size for iPod as 5 gigabyte. Um, by 2001 standard, that's a lot, um, very small size. And here's a kind of a smaller font, say 100 sounds at 106k bits ray. And in his presentation, instead of um, emphasizing this again, uh, and in, in his real demo of the real um, iPod, uh, he basically um, acted out um, and say that you can put a hundred songs in your pocket, and this is actually Steve Jobs uh, tried to put the iPod in uh, in his uh, pocket. Okay, um, and, and that's a great act because for most of us, um, if you say five gigabyte, it really doesn't mean much to us because we don't know how many songs that you can store. And, and here they try to actually do a little bit of translation um, in, in terms of, yeah, it's, it's 100 sound, and then an average sound may, may, um, may need several megabytes to store it. And you need to do a little bit of calculation to get that. Um, but this is actually, people understand it, OK? 100 sound is 100 sound. Uh, no translation will be needed. A guy Kawasaki, who used to work at Apple, uh, worked with Steve Jobs, uh, for Steve Jobs, and now is an entrepreneur. And he derived something called, for presentation, a rule of 10, 20, 30 rules. Um, and basically, if you do use PowerPoint for presentation, um, you should have just 10 slides and no more than 20 minutes, which means two minutes per slide on average. 
and the font uh, in your slide should be no smaller than uh, 30 points. Um, and a lot of time in my teaching, I violate such rules, um, but teaching um, kind of different than the type of presentation that Guy Sawasaki um, is re was referring to. He more or less talking about the a startup company doing a pitch for their business idea. Um, but it, it's applicable to a lot of other scenarios as well. Um, he also recommended um, the storytelling skill by his friend uh, Carl Reynold. Uh, you can find this uh, YouTube video about another um, vi uh, the video. And Steve Jobs, um, a lot of times, like to use the, the whiteboard to kind of draw out what he has in mind. Uh, he tried to explain, for instance, his strategy. This is when he um, became the CEO the second time. He found that Apple has too many product lines. He tried to classify their product and simplify it. And this is kind of, he drew it out, there's a pro professional market, there's a consumer market, there's a desktop, and then there's a laptop. And so there's kind of four uh, area that the Apple should focus on. And each area, Apple should have just one or two product. And he's very good in terms of explaining his strategy um, using the whiteboard in this case. He's also a very persuasive guy. And and in in the early day of Apple's history, um, the board really wanted to have somebody more mature. Uh, I, I think Steve Jobs was um, is is um, under thirty years old uh, at that time, twenty something, and so he he uh, found John Scully, uh, who was. Um, very higher up uh, in the marketing area at, for Pepsi, and maybe even the president. Um, so Steve Jobs convinced him to come to work for Apple. At that time, Apple is really not um, as a great company as we know it now. So for uh, John Scully to kind of jump ships to come to Apple, uh, it takes a lot of um, courage for John Scully. But at the same time, um, Steve Jobs um, is very persuasive. And this is what he said to John Scully. Do you want to spend the rest of your life selling sugared water? Or do, uh, or do you want a chance to change the world? Um, and, and this is how um, Steve Jobs eventually being able to recruit John Scully uh, at the time. And here it's actually the president of uh, Pepsi, um, uh, PepsiCo. Okay. An another great talk um, that uh, you can easily find this link. Uh, just use this as a keyword to find a TED talk um, by uh, Simon Sinek. Um, and in, in this case, he didn't use any actual PowerPoint slide. He just drew on the flip chart. A large flip chart was um, and and was marker and and basically he. Um, explained uh, how a great company started always with something called why. Why we're doing this and, and then explained um, what it is and how to do it. Uh, in, in my teaching, actually, I've been using similar approach uh, even before Simon Sinek mentioned this. I always try to um, at least in a lot of my lecture, explaining why you need to learn this in the first place. It's different than what Simon was talking about. Um, to, why is how you motivate uh, people to, to really paying attention to what you're going to discuss. And then you, usually I will explain what, what it is, explaining terminology, and explain how, how you're going to do it, how it's kind of the skill set. At the end of the day, uh, in terms of the university educational environment. It's not just knowing certain terminology, um, but also learn how to do it. Uh, that's the kind of skill set aside of the education training. So he made a, um, he wrote a book uh, actually based on his talk um, and, 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 <clears throat> and you can find his book. And I think he wrote several books on uh, afterward and become a very popular um, 
kind of speaker that that on the speech uh, circle, um, speaker circle that people uh, uh, pay him to come and give a talk in certain event. Okay. Most recently, um, actually, Facebook uh, announced um, that it's going to change its name to uh, Meta, which came from um, science fiction, uh, which describes something called Metaverse, which means kind of a virtual world, or maybe a mixture of the real world and the virtual world. And this, uh, there's a, a bunch of video which I listed here in terms of um, Facebook's announcement of changing it. Facebook's name to Meta. Uh, Facebook actually own a lot of companies, so Meta is almost like parent company. There's there, there will be still Facebook, um, but they will be uh, Instagram. There's WhatsApp and 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 other company they acquire will keep their own uh, brand name. And uh, this list of uh, playlists and uh, you can find on YouTube. Uh, they are. Uh, they, they are demonstration of uh, social interaction in this metaverse and also uh, the work future work environment in the metaverse uh, when whether this vision um, of the so-called metaverse will um, play out uh, still uh, need to be seen um, but it's something worth uh, paying attention to. And in, in terms of communication is that how do you communicate with people um, through information technology? Um, by, we mentioned by email and by video conferencing and, and here now is actually in the virtual environment. Okay, you still need to interact and communicate with other players. Um, or actor in this virtual world. And some may be even artificial intelligence, uh, AI or artificial intelligence generated character, but some actually there is, some avatar actually has a real person behind it. Okay, um, the, the next topic, we're going to talk a little bit about the visual communication. And I'm going to use, uh, the COVID pandemic and some of the things that I have seen, how people use the kind of visual t uh, way to communicate um, on the message. And and this is actually just show, uh, try to explain to people why you need to wear a mask. Um, not many words, and basically just say if, if either you have COVID, as on the left hand side or not, if uh, if you wear mask regardless, and um, that's the lowest risk, okay. And if you don't wear mask, that's the highest risk. And, and certainly, there's some people who, uh, don't believe in mask wearing. Um, uh, it, it's a personal choice, and, and and sometimes it's the requirement by the, your business, your organization, your university, or even the government. Um, the state government uh, sometimes mandate that in certain situations people need to wear masks uh, when the COVID cases are really high. Um, but it, it's a, uh, at the end of the day, it, it's a personal choice. So you have to kind of risk the inconvenience and the risk that that and which way do you want to go. Uh, this is actually um, a visual um, show how to wear mask properly. Uh, you probably can find video to show you how to wear mask properly. Uh, a, a phrase that we hear quite often uh, during the pandemic is, uh, in the, particularly in the early day, is um, something called flatten the curve. Um, and it, it's quite interesting. Um, the It's hard to visualize what flatten the curve is until you see a visual presentation of it. And and when they say flatten the curve, what the, the hidden message, the message is actually um, you, they, we, 
the government or the health public health official try to convince people that uh, they need to take certain measures uh, such as social distance to reduce the cases such that uh, the, the the case number would be low enough that our health care system can handle it okay and, and in this case, uh, this is by economists, um, really based on a CDC's um, uh, a publication before COVID hit us, um, which means that we, in, instead of a search um, and a pick without any protective measures, um, the, the case will be this high. And if we can take certain measure, we can reduce the height of the epidemic or pandemic pick and uh, what is a little bit confusing in this diagram this the the y-axis is really about number of infection which was strong here uh, that's not so clear um, um, and, and and people may wonder what does this mean okay and this is the original uh, CDC's chart um, they do lay it out like we want to Number one, we want to move this to delay the outbreaks peak. And then number two is to uh, decompress the peak burden on hospital and infrastructure. And that's the reason. The reason we want the peak not so high uh, is because uh, the hospitals cannot handle this high uh, outbreak peak if we don't decompress it. And, and number three, um, hopefully we would diminish or decrease the overall cases and the health impact okay um, <clears throat> Drew Harris um, you, you can you can follow him on Twitter um, use the same diagram uh, from CDC and the economist and he drew a line to make it a little bit more clear that this is the capacity of a health care um, system and the reason we want to flatten the curve is that our hospitals can handle the patients uh, that need care uh, such that we would not have um, overflowed um, overcrowded ICU beds and units and we have enough uh, ventilator for people who need it okay it's um, simplified um, the, the diagram in the sense but um, in um, but added just this dotted line, which um, this has been used by actually many other uh, news outlets and, and just changing the previous diagram a little bit. Okay. And let's see, I think I have a video here. Okay. Show you without the protect measures and with protect the measure and how the curve will be changed okay so um, <clears throat> another um, video that I have seen is add another uh, twist to it uh, not only um, mentioned that we want to uh, flatten the curve but also uh, we may want to um, raise the line which the capacity of the hospital in terms of the care of the patient uh, so you can do both not just flatten the curve so hospital um, can they get more ventilators and and add ICU bed and things like that? Certainly, it's not easy. I mean, particularly like adding the ICU capacity. Um, but um, for instance, provide online health education, home care, and telemedicine, and to uh, reduce a necessary hospital visit uh, will be um, ways to do it. Okay. Uh, this is just another animated version um, kind of show that how we can flatten the curve um, instead of uh, consider COVID as just another bad flu um, here um, that 
say washing hand, not touching face, and stay home when um, when you're sick. And go only go to hospital when you really need that uh, medical profession's attention. Okay, so that's just a simple example, um, and you probably will find a lot of other visual communication example um, for COVID uh, prevention and and how you should um, how we should deal with it. <clears throat> if we step back and look at various um, communication scenario situation where you need to communicate with other people or as a listeners in certain setting, um, we, we need to, um, we can kind of classify it. We mentioned different, um, for instance, purpose for communication, like um, there are many categories, but here we only saying kind of is a social occasion or it's more task oriented. Okay, uh, like team building is a little bit more social than task oriented. And so there is dimension for communication scenario, for instance, uh, the group size. Um, I, I call it cardinality and group size. The group can be um, interpersonal, which is one to one, um, or um, one to few, small group, and one to larger group, or even to um, really large group um, for public communication. And so it could be one to one, one to few, one to many, or many to many. When I say many to many, which means it's more kind of two um, two way communication, which which kind of explain here a little bit more. Uh, is it formal, semi formal, or informal? Okay, and is it in person and or it's virtual? Uh, through audio or audio and video or in the so-called um, the, the true t uh, virtual reality world like what metaverse uh, describe okay and, and if you have high degree of presence such as in person or in the so-called virtual reality world um, relatively speaking you have high degree of presence um, you're, you're facing actually uh, different challenge. In person, there's a challenge for in person. There's also challenge for the virtual environment as well. Is the communication uh, scheduled regularly, like um, weekly staff meeting, or it's scheduled ad hoc? Um, and directional is important. Is it uh, is communication? upward or downward in the organizational hierarchy um, reporting to your boss and 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 or downward to give your subordinate certain instruction or information or is it um, lateral to your co-worker and colleague uh, within department or across department or even to some stakeholder outside your business Okay, interaction. We mentioned interaction. It could be just one way. Um, somebody just talking. Um, here I'm actually doing one way communication. Um, active participant. Uh, if if it's a synchronous like Zoom meeting, then I can ask the 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 audience to provide feedback, ask questions, and so I can make sure they understand the message. And it can be very interactive, which is kind of two-way communication. Uh, no, no, nobody is the 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 main character who dominate the um, situation. That's only talking head. Uh, so a lot of people can participate more equally. Uh, that's what I mean by more interactively. Um, are you getting the feedback? No feedback. Few feedback. A little bit. Some feedback or constant feedback you're getting and the feedback can be instance right away in in the face-to-face -face meeting in the zoom meeting and and it can be delay which means that um, you don't get the feedback until much later like we do uh, um, um, a class survey at the end of the semester by the time we get the survey it may be a little too late and we can use that information to improve for the next semesters but it's too late to uh, actually make any improvement because the semester uh, is considered over 
the audience is it internal external uh, are the, the audience a novice or an expert and this is important a lot of people will make presentation using a lot of uh, technical jargon and and for novice audience and that's a big mistake you, you want to be able to explain it in the using the the terminology um, and the example that the your audience are familiar with Uh, this is um, another way to look at the communication pattern. Uh, is it in circle? This is a very typical, almost like the organizational structure. It goes from the top to the bottom. And certainly there's a bottom-up communication to collect feedback. This is uh, on the top. It's more one-to-one, -one, kind of up and down communication, and then the spread out. It could be a wheel with somebody at the center um, of the wheel and then communicate with a lot of other people. And it's purely a network pattern, which means uh, you can communicate with anybody else uh, who would consider your peer. It's kind of peer-to-peer -peer network. And the, the wheel um, structure that we're seeing here, uh, if you look at this slide, um, this is when Steve Jobs was the CEO, and he he basically, as the center of this spheres and, and circle, surrounded by his top lieutenant, and um, the, for instance, chief uh, COO, chief o operating officer, Tim, um, Tim Cook, who is now the CEO after the um, death of Steve Jobs. And Johnny Ive, I'm not sure whether he's still at Apple, but uh, he he was the chief um, designer, and and he's the kind of the brand behind a lot of uh, wonderful design of Apple's product. Design here, we're talking about more or less of the product design, the exterior uh, the, 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 that you see, not the internal circuitry, software, etc. Okay. And Steve Jobs certainly very interesting in the design aspect. So he he um, got along with uh, uh, Johnny Ive uh, very well. And, and a lot of people actually were, um, was kind of speculating at that time that uh, Johnny I uh, may um, succeed Steve Jobs as a CEO, but uh, eventually it's the uh, operational guy, uh, uh, Tim Cook, uh, uh, took over the CEO's position. <coughs> and they work with their subordinate. And however, um, Apple, when Steve Jobs was in charge, um, once a year he would select a hundred employee uh, some may not be higher up uh, in 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 the peripheral um, to um, to kind of try to create vision for the next year and years down the road <coughs> and it's I believe it's a week-long meeting so that's another kind of setting for it, it's almost like a retreat that organ a lot of organization would um, would, um, would hold uh, on an annual basis. And that's another setting to kind of communicate in a more casual setting so people that can talk without um, worry too much about their rank and things like that. <coughs> Here, just um, reiterate some of the tips for effective communication. Um, be clear, be concise. Uh, can be easily understood um, and be aware of the context of the whole um, scenario and situations and also even as a speaker you uh, need to have ability to listen and listen is very important and also be open to feedback okay and your message need to be specific timely personal and sincere and and that's important here uh, in the next um, 
two slides, I think I'm going to introduce um, something which is very specific uh, based on something we call this uh, language act um, theory. Um, it's about communication and also about coordination particularly. And this is a simple version. Okay, uh, If we have two parties who kind of in communicating with each other, okay, customer, supplier, um, or just A and B. Um, a requests certain things, they define their requirement, I want to buy this product, okay, so they make their request, okay, and, and then the supplier uh, can certainly uh, accept the request as it is, or can negotiate that. Uh, in terms of pricing, features, whatever. And through, so there is a lot of interaction in the negotiation stage. And eventually they come to agreement, hopefully. And sometimes they decided, the supplier decided not to take the case. And that's the end of the story. And once agreed, then the supplier will continue to perform the requested task, product, service, whatever. And once it's finished, and report it back on maybe shipping the product to the customer. The, the customer may look at your your study, your report, the received product, and decide whether this is actually uh, consistent with what they asked for, and and decided to accept it, and sometimes even reject it, or ask you to revise it. If they accept it, they will pay you. And this is certainly in this diagram, we're showing that everything seems to go smoothly. Okay, so they make the request, you negotiate it, and then you make you agreed on it, and then you will perform the job, and you report it back to the customer and accept it. So it's kind of several step in this sequence of uh, kind of um, language act or speech act. Okay, and in in. The reason this can be useful in, in guiding our thinking, you don't have to follow it um, too seriously, but it's like when, when you send a message, you probably expect something from the counterpart. And what is that? And then this back and forth, it's their feedback. They say, yes, I, I'll do it. Okay, I got it. I'll do it. And then they did it. And there's a, and they, this they send the result back to you, the deliverable back to you, and then you can decide whether to take it or not. Okay. This is a more refined version. You make a request, okay. A make a request, and <clears throat> and B can uh, promise they're going to to do it, or B can decline or reject the request. Or B can negotiate. This is actually negotiation, counter offer. Okay, so one request from A, there are three possible action from B: decline, reject it, um, negotiate, and make counter offer back and forth. Okay, counter offer here. Okay, by B, and then. B can counter offer as well, and, and then eventually uh, B can promise to do it or not. Okay. And this go on, and eventually um, the B, will re the, which is in the previous slides, the supplier can report completion, and the A can decline the report, uh, decline your report completion. You say you completed, but no, you, you didn't complete it. And, and, and eventually, uh, um, so they are different um, state in this coordination state machine as we call it and and different communi conversations um, or communication will move you sometime from one state to the other okay this is conversation stay uh, this is stay com completion or sometimes just rejection is considered completion you're done Okay, or you cancel the count contract, you cancel the request, you cancel the meeting. Um, so think about this. I mean, 
there, there used to be a software actually supporting something like this, but it's not very popular. But the conceptual, I think it's useful. Uh, when you send an email and say, hey, um, can you do this for me? Then you expect the receiver to respond properly, like yes or no, maybe. And when you receive some request uh, by email or verbally, then you, you, you're doing the same thing. You, you kind of have three options, right? one two and three and you want to make it clear so otherwise it's kind of hanging there and very fuzzy and then i did ask but what did you say and 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 that's not a good situation so you want to have clear understand what situation you're in uh, when you initiate a conversation okay uh, to be a good leader, you need to learn to be a good follower. To be a good communicator, you need to learn to be a good listener. So there's something we call it active listening skill um, that um, we can learn from um, in order to be a good listener and eventually a good um, speaker. Because you, if you know how to get people's attention, um, then you are a good communicator. As a good listener, you need to be uh, attentive, paying attention, um, ask kind of open question. Uh, people like, I mean, your professors, um, they, they like feedback, and at least most of them. Um, ask probing questions who may actually help um, the speaker to think uh, together with you uh, on something that they never thought of. Okay, um, I, I do have um, a situation uh, taking classes and the instructor will come question, will come sometime challenging question um, and, and will come question that see things from different perspective. Okay. Uh, request clarification. Uh, don't be afraid of request for clarification uh, because sometimes the, the the speaker may be so uh, immersed in the area they know. Uh, they're using all the terminology that nobody understands. Um, if you can ask questions such that he can kind of explain it such that you can understand it and think other audience probably will also appreciate it when you ask this uh, clarification question. <clears throat> uh, paraphrase means actually you, you kind of say, well, uh, you just, you just, uh, if I understand you properly, uh, what you said, uh, it, it, is this what you mean? Uh, you kind of paraphrase what you have heard. Okay. And, and a lot of time try to summarize what you have heard. Um, and as a speaker, sometimes you would actually do the summarization at the end of your speech as well. Once again, um, as, as a good listener, you, you kind of use encouraging words um, to kind of, yeah, yeah, I get it, nodding and things like that. Um, and such that you make the speaker feel that, yeah, you're getting it and they'll continue unhappily. Um, <clears throat> and you may, um, <clears throat> you can repeat what a speaker has said in a different way. Uh, this is kind of confirm you are getting it. Uh, this is one of the feedback. Remember the feedback loop? Um, providing feedback and that's important okay you can say well in, in the way that I understand it then uh, I think you try to say the quantum computing really means that we can have super powerful computer than the traditional computer etc etc okay is that the case I mean asking asking open-ended question okay um, and thanks the speaker to share their knowledge their idea and that uh, etc and and um, and the body language certainly it can be very telling. Okay. How to improve your listening habit? Okay. To be prepared to be receptive. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> don't anticipate. It really means don't have a kind of preconceived notion what this is all about. You may be surprised. Summarize what you heard and write jot down some 
something on your notebook um, and focus on the speakers when he or she was talking. Um, sometimes we were distracted with other things, um, looking at our phone and iPad, etc. And, and try to understand the sender or the speaker's point of view and seek clarifications, uh, have proper eye contact and, and nonverbal feedback that we mentioned. Um, um, be open-minded and but focus on the objective of this communication act or uh, whatever the situation is. And also pay attention to what is not said. Okay, uh, could be the body language, whatever. And sometimes you may find some hesitancy in the speaker when he or she discuss certain thing. Uh, if it's appropriate, you may want to say, yeah, it's something else that you really think you want to tell us. Okay. Um, asking questions sometimes can be difficult. A lot of people would, uh, are afraid of asking questions because they may show a sign of not very knowledgeable, not capable. Um, but but I think uh, a good questioners uh, as a listeners uh, in this kind of communication setting uh, actually show that your you get it, you paying attention, you are thinking things through, uh, you are contributing to the conversation. Um, and so it is important that you learn how to ask questions as the receivers in the communication process. Um, so this kind of, I came up with a few, you probably can come up with something even better than mine. And for instance, let me make sure that I understand what you just said. And do you mean the following? Okay, uh, just to make sure we all on the same page. And this is what I use a lot. Uh, when, when, when you're kind of embarrassed to ask some really simple question, like you don't even know this. I mean, somebody throw an acronym, everybody seems to understand it, but you're the only one who have no idea what that is. And, and this is how you can ask the question. Just say, yeah, I know what that X, Y, Z really mean, but um, it could mean different things to different people. Um, when people talking about uh, quantum computing, but what exactly in your in your view, quantum computing is all about. Uh, can you kind of define it for us in in your talk before we go on? Something like that. So just make sure that we all are on the same page. Okay. <clears throat> and this is sometimes I will ask. If, if sometimes I was in the meeting and before maybe the key person start talking, um, I will ask the question, say, can, can somebody provide me with some background why we have this meeting? I'm, 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 by the way, I'm not against this meeting at all. And just say, so, so I, I have more the kind of a background knowledge to, to know why we call this meeting. Um, I remembered um, we have a candidate um, we're interviewing some candidate without getting to the detail, and then I was I was um, I serve on the committee this semester, and the committee member um, was asked to meet with the candidate, and I was a little bit confused. So first I asked, so I asked the the person who arranged the meeting uh, this question, like why. This is such arrangement, and what's our role in this meeting, and what should we say, and not say, and 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 I think that's important. Okay, <clears throat> and uh, the, the, this one is just somebody is talking about something very theoretical and and very abstract, and you can ask them to give you a more concrete example. I think that always help. As a speaker, it's always very helpful that you use real example, a real case. Um, and, and sometimes a real case can be difficult to, to, um, uh, to find. Then you can use some analogy okay, um, to, to describe um, some ab very abstract concept. Okay, um, and and once again, then when you ask for clarification, um, 
it's a lot of time it's not you don't understand it and because you believe other audience may be confused but they're afraid to ask so uh, it can be very helpful if you can ask the question ask for clarification it will help others not just not for yourself actually that happened okay and sometimes I, I know exactly what that terminology is but I know that other people don't have the background then I'll ask the speaker that yeah uh, maybe it's a good thing for you to explain that uh, what this mean okay and other people will appreciate it okay uh, a little bit on the uh, office design. Um, I, I'm interested in creativity and and, and somehow um, bump into this issue in terms of the physical space. Sometimes um, it's important um, as, as the um, affect how we communicate, how we interact. And and the the key issues and we try to point out is that we want to have proper meeting space and here they call it surprising meeting space for people to meet to share idea and data and and <coughs> and to provide something we uh, some people call it chance encounter. Okay, a particular chance encounter of people who may belong to different uh, groups, different department, because a lot of great idea came from people from different discipline. Okay, so the coffee break, um, tea time, and and provide more casual meeting space uh, would be important part of it. Okay, and here. Um, um, it stated that chaos is an integral part of creativity. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you a few office um, or um, architecture design, um, office design, and and this is by the, the greatest architect of the 20th century, I M Pei. Um, um, it's it's mess up laboratory at the National Center of Atmospheric Research uh, in Boulder, Colorado, and the um, the the design actually was inspired by the um, Aboriginals um, um, architecture for their living space, um, probably a thousand years ago, and so it also blended in with the environment. Okay, if you see the color, it's, the color is similar to the color of the mountain behind it. And, and also very similar to the, um, to, to the, um, the original people's uh, living environment. And, and inside, uh, first of all, there's a long winding road to go up to the building. Uh, so people can kind of calm down, change their mindset um, from, from home to office. Uh, this kind of reminds me about the um, Getty Museum uh, near 405 and, and has that, that you have to park um, at the um, the parking lot and then take the uh, I guess electrical train to go up um, slowly to kind of calm you down and see the scenery below you a little bit and and then there's a meeting place here inside outside and and etc oh I see there's there's some deer outside I'm I'm not sure whether that's um, the sculpture or, or live deers okay this is Pixar's, um, the movie maker's uh, office. Uh, you see there's a meeting space. This may be their lobby, okay. And I believe they put their mail room somewhere in the middle behind here. So everybody need to go to that meet, um, mail room to pick up their mail. That also create a chance for a chance encounter. Um, and, and this is kind of they have people can play and talk and chat and they, they do have more formal meeting rooms um, and and they have 
when they're in the movie production, they have this so-called daily review at the end of the day to review what has been done. And you're not allowed to use PowerPoint. And then they do have a lot of kind of audio, visual, and screen to show what has been done. And sometimes they will play out some scene uh, in the movie and the people will provide feedback and, and sharing so everybody know what's going on so it's kind of a this kind of a peer culture is very important okay uh, people who are more seniors considered to be the brand trust they're here to give um, advice not uh, command Inside a room, um, it can be a physical place. Um, then you need to thinking about the seating layout. Um, it could be is, is a room small or large room, and you can decide how the seating arrangement will be. If it's um, like a lecture, then certainly this will be appropriate. Like our Smith Center is kind of designed in this way. Um, a lot of conference, conference, big conference, then they may lay it out the sitting this way but smaller meeting on um, a round table sometimes would be good and if it's a little more people then you, you can arrange differently um, for for virtual um, meeting like zoom um, a lot of time will ask the audience to t turn on their video so I can at least I can see them um, to see their kind of facial expression and to see when they're, they're engaged. Uh, metaverse we mentioned certainly is at another le level up. <coughs> uh, last, uh, not the least, is the verbal, nonverbal communication, in particular your body language, your eye contact, facial expression, and postures, um, etc. And and be aware of uh, and, and pay attention to uh, some cultural differences. I, I can give you an example. I um, had once um, a, a teaching assistant work for me. I think he came from India. And several occasions I was, I was um, given him um, instruction like, can you do this? And etc. And, and he, he always shake his head. Um, then I interpret that as no. He was saying no or I don't understand this. So I kind of repeat that. And only after a few times after a while and then I realized when when he shake his head it really means he understand it. Okay, which is quite different. Okay. Hand gestures and and etc. Um, and so so um, be sensitive to different culture and the difference uh, in different culture and, and make sure you uh, express yourself properly and also you understand um, other people's um, um, nonverbal communication signals uh, interpreted properly. <clears throat> and here is the uh, a study of different body language. You can watch the video and follow this link. Um, this is, uh, you can probably tell very clearly. Um, the top one, a high power body language. And and the, the this row at the bottom is low power body language. And, and this certainly show the competence. Um, but you need to be careful. I mean, do you, do you want to pretend you're, I mean, you're very powerful in confidence? Uh, a lot of times, if you're sitting like this talking to your colleague, that, in my opinion, is considered impolite. Okay. Um, it depends on the situation. Okay. So use the proper gestures and body language to show uh, some. Um, send certain messages, okay, um, be a little careful. But certainly I would not recommend you to show this type of um, uh, forms of body language unless, well, like a kids, you, you did something wrong and then you try to apologize. Then you may set up like this way, okay. You don't want to set up like this way when your parents 
um, kind of um, try to point out that you did something wrong. Okay. Uh, this is um, a TED talk about how your body language may shape who you are. Uh, this is a picture. Okay, and this is what happened when you put together high and low power. Okay, and you're welcome to follow the link and to watch it. Last, not the least, uh, we need to go back to our communication process model. Uh, this is a similar model than we show at the beginning of the this module. And and once again, uh, there's a sender. Um, you have a purpose. You want to send a message. You craft your message in code. It's really you need to carefully design your message uh, properly and send out in the proper channel by email, by memo, by in person talking to to people and make they are a noise in your environment. And also the sender and the receiver, they have different experience. And do you have common um, experience, knowledge, and that also determine how you want to craft your message. And the receiver need to translate what they receive, the message they receive, to understand the intention and purpose and decide what to do next. And the receiver also play an important role in this communication process is to provide proper uh, feedback by responding to um, to the request. Uh, remember that coordination theory, that speech act or language act perspective of coordination, and and you need to provide proper feedback so it become a um, a, a positive a, a loop. Okay, that uh, that's more healthy. Okay, last there is a link which um, you can take a test and say how good are your communication skill is. And so follow this link and take the test, and you can kind of get an idea about your communication skill. And once again, communication is very important um, as a business professional, as a leader uh, in the management setting in an organization. So I hope you benefit from this um, module. And there are certainly other resources, uh, other courses that are available to you and, and hope you take advantage of that. OK, thank you. Uh, this is the end of the whole communication module. Bye bye.